Mr. Cropper, thank you for four video responses. I was not expecting that. Um, but I'm overjoyed that you've done it because I think it will benefit each of us. Uh, even if we don't change our minds, maybe it will benefit others who watch us because we do have two very divergent perspectives. And I think uh, when others watch um, such not necessarily opposed perspectives, but contrasting perspectives, um, uh, those others are able to um, uh, become aware of the possibilities um, which exist for trying to understand our place in the universe. And the more possibilities and perspectives that each of us are aware of, the closer we come to seeing what's really going on. Um, and, you know, maybe this is a difference between us. You're an objectivist. You say there is one rational way of knowing the world, one world, one kind of knowledge, anything that falls outside this is wrong. Whereas, from my perspective, um, there are many ways of knowing, and each one gives us a partial perspective of what we call reality. Um, because as I tried to explain in my last video, my epistemological um, stance is that the knower and the known are part of one process. There is no human subject or scientist which stands outside of nature and knows it objectively. Now, uh, what science calls nature, this system of laws, um, is an abstraction. Science begins by experimenting upon the concrete and eventually arrives at some generalizations called laws, usually in the form of mathematical equations. Um, but nature is still this concrete community of living beings and relationships among them, um, at least on Earth. Certainly outside of the Earth, uh, nature is a system of uh, the relationship between varying uh, types of matter uh, and energy. Um, but still, let's, let's stick to Earth for a second and recognize that there is this scientific nature and abstraction uh, which we can derive various abstract general laws about through experimentation and measurement and so forth, but there is also um, this other nature which is concrete, which is the actual uh, living community of beings which inhabit the planet with human beings. Um, and so when we recognize this, you know, you could almost say there's an exterior and an interior side of nature. The exterior is what science measures. Um, you know, the scientist stands back and observes uh, you know, an animal as a machine and puts it on the, um, in the laboratory and slices it up and sees how all the organs interact as though um, it were a car engine. And we can gain a lot of valuable knowledge about this, but the, the problem is the animal, well, first of all, felt pain when you cut it up. It has an interior enjoyment of its life, just as human beings enjoy their lives. Every living creature has uh, an enjoyment has a has a, a reason for living, um, and so to talk about the natural non-human world as though it had no value, I think is absurd. I mean, even Aristotle recognized the natural purposes in the non-human world that every being has a reason for being, and then it moves towards certain ends. Every creature has its own purposes, not just human beings. Uh, and I think it's an extreme form of anthropocentrism that I would accuse Kant of, just as much as, as you, um, that makes us think that only the human being has value, only the human being is conscious, and only the human being enjoys its experience. Um, there are many forms of experience which are uh, not conscious in the very sophisticated way that human beings are conscious, um, just as we have other forms of experience, and through those other forms of experience, whether they be aesthetic or um, mathematical or um, emotional uh, or athletic, um, you know, kinesthetic, all of these ways of knowing exist on different levels of our experience that rationality really has nothing to say about. Rationality is that way of knowing which, act, which is active in our verbal, linguistic, uh, attempts to know the world. And outside of what can be verbalized, knowledge exists on a different plane, not on an irrational plane, but on a non-rational plane. And I think animals possess these other types of experience, 
and enjoy these other types of experiences and value them even though they can't rationally speak about them. Rational speech is one function which the human being possesses that other animals, at least so far as we know, I mean, I question whether dolphins have some type of sophisticated means of communication. Their brain's 40% larger than ours. They don't have thumbs, and so they don't have the manipulative uh, form of technology that human beings have devised. But nonetheless, um, we have no reason for uh, assuming that they're less intelligent than us if we grant that there are many forms of intelligence, aside from the technological manipulative kind. Um, so where else can we go from here? Well, the idea that nature, uh, get, forget this word nature, the, the idea that the earth is a whole, that it is one biosphere, a living system, um, is well established in, in biology and ecology. I'm not making this up or getting it from some environmental cult. Um, you know, it's known as the Gaia hypothesis, James Lovelock and uh, Lynn Margulis, two very well-respected um, biologists. Um, Lovelock worked for NASA originally. Um, Margulis discovered the theory of symbiogenesis, um, which allowed us to understand how the first uh, eukaryotic cells evolved. Um, so well, very well-respected scientists have uh, recognized that the Earth's climate uh, is, is self-sustaining and self-organizing, and it maintains a certain equilibrium by regulating you know, the carbon dioxide uh, and other chemical components uh, in the atmosphere. And if this large-scale system was not regulating the temperature of the Earth, um, it would have become inhospitable for life many, uh, maybe a billion or two billion years ago, because the sun has been increasing in temperature over the course of the uh, last few billion years. It's 25 percent brighter and hotter today than it was when life began. But life uh, because of the chemicals it releases and this self-organizing um, system and the climate that has materialized has been able to lower the temperature relative to the increasing temperature of the sun over the past few billion years. Um, and there are all kinds of interconnected cycles and systems that work on a planetary level uh, in such a way. And the reason it's dangerous for human beings um, to have expanded from about a billion people at the beginning of the century to almost seven billion now is that we are taking up the habitats of these other creatures and species we are polluting their waters uh, in some cases damming the river so that there aren't any waters at all um, and you know there's a big difference between the Hoover Dam and a Beavers Dam so let's not make that comparison um, so the expansion of the human population on the earth and our uh, way of uh, harvesting what we call the raw materials of the earth to support and sustain our consumerist economy is causing what 7 out of 10 uh, scientists, according to a recent Washington Post article, agree is the largest mass extinction since the asteroid or the meteorite that killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Um, this is not to say that we aren't in um, living currently in um, or on a planet with the most biodiversity in its history. This much is true, but we are still losing 20 to 50,000 species per year, which is many thousands of times greater than the background rate of extinction um, in between the mass extinctions which have occurred in the past. So certainly there have been mass extinctions without human beings here to cause them, but this mass extinction is being caused by human beings. Um, and this is not to say that I hate human beings. I think human beings can find and have lived in the past in uh, radically different ways than our current industrialized system. And I would dispute the fact that uh, our obsession with technology has necessarily made us happier. Um, you know, there have been plenty of studies on the psychological well-being and happiness of people in developed nations that shows that um, often, more often than not, we either exist um, uh, on a level of well-being or happiness equal to those in uh, lesser privileged, less technologically advanced uh, cultures and regions, uh, if not lower uh, on the scale of happiness. Um, and, you know, certainly measuring happiness is subjective, but you get the point. Uh, technology sometimes makes life way more complicated than we as human beings are capable of um, working with. And so it can be almost overwhelming for many living in the modern industrial world. Uh, 
part two.